Okay, thank you. Let me know at 10. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Praise God. So glad to see you all again. But I heard you all were in good hands. Praise God. Learning and receiving about the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And we're going to kind of continue with that vein a little bit. I was actually uh, ministering uh, somewhat about in, in, in that same uh, area. Uh, but I, I was just placing emphasis. Uh, well, it, 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 it actually is the same thing. Because you, you, your subject was the power of the Holy so, so, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about power. So, uh, good to see all of y'all here. And uh, just thank God for everybody that had a part in, in these, these glorious uh, decor. Praise God. It's exciting. It's beautiful. Amen. And so we'll, uh, we'll get right on into the word. Just ask you that you just release uh, your faith and join with me. Uh, believe in God for utterance uh, tonight. Uh, for revelation, uh, and, 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 and let's, let's be deliberate and intentional uh, listening uh, to hear God tonight, amen? Uh, it, we we want to hear from the Spirit of God, uh, corporately but individually, and, uh, because it's, it's what we hear from Him, uh, that anointed utterance that we hear that causes faith to come, and that faith is the empowerment we need to act and obey and, and at the same time, that faith connects with the power necessary to make our actions and our obedience successful and prosperous. Amen. So let's 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 believe God to hear uh, from him for us. Amen. Praise God. So <clears throat> to my, my subject tonight uh, is walking in the supernatural, walking in the supernatural. And, and that's really a shortened version of uh the, the topic uh, that I was ministering from Sunday down at, uh, at Living Faith, which the full title was Receiving Supernatural Help for the Restoration of All Things. Receiving Supernatural Help for the Restoration of All Things. So I just kind of shortened it to walking in the supernatural. Uh, just for teaching purposes. But I do want to encourage us uh, as we are hearing this word and as we're applying in our lives, I want to encourage us to expect the supernatural in our lives. Amen? Amen? All right, so let's open our Bibles uh, tonight to, let's go to Acts chapter 3. Let's go to Acts chapter 3. And... Uh, Let's read a couple of verses there. Acts 3, beginning at verse uh, 19. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to read from the, from the Amplified uh, Classic translation. Uh, so it reads, so repent, change your mind and purpose, turn around and return to God, that your sins may be erased, blotted out, wiped clean, right? Change your mind, change your purpose, turn around and return to God. Now, <clears throat> I want to lift, I just want to present this as a principle tonight in terms of repentance, right? Not from the standpoint of a sinner receiving Jesus Christ and repenting, but those of us uh, who are already saved, we know that we have an advocate in the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever liveth to make intercession on our behalf, right? Uh, however, if we sin, right, uh, the Bible talks about confessing that sin and that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all our unrighteousness, 1 John 1 and 9. And we have talked about how that word forgiveness, uh, forgiving us, used in 1 John 1 and 9, is different from the word forgiving us that's used in Ephesians 4 and 32. The one in Ephesians 4 and 32 is completely unconditional forgiveness. 
eternal forgiveness, which all of us have received, all of us walk in daily as God's righteousness. It's completely unconditional. It belongs to us because we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen? So 1 John 1 and 9, the usage of forgiveness is not that. The usage of forgiveness in, in 1 John 1 and 9 is on a conditional basis, but it has nothing to do with eternal life. It has, no, excuse me, it has nothing to do with going to heaven or remaining in right standing. This type of forgiveness is conditional upon our acknowledgement that we have erred, that we have been wrong, that we have sinned, that we've chosen wrongly. And the, and the purpose for acknowledging that is so that our fellowship and the level of intimacy and communion we can enjoy with God is not hindered in any way. It's not about losing your salvation. Are you following what I'm saying? So, so now, with that in mind, let's, let's apply that to what we're hearing here in verse 19. So once again, let me read this from the Amplified. It says to repent, change your mind and purpose turn around and return to God. And so oftentimes we, 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 we need to just kind of pause and, 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 and allow God to just uh, let us in on some things, how we may have slipped, how we may have misstepped, how we may have taken a wrong turn, um, how maybe we've opened our heart up to some teaching, uh, some ideology and doctrine that's, that's not really consistent with the truth, that's not actually from heaven, uh, because there is such a thing as uh, the doctrines of devils and seducing spirits that can lead us astray. Uh, there's, there's, there, is, um, there, there is that which is being talked about a lot in the, in the body of Christ now that's highly controversial, and you got to make sure you're rightly dividing the word so you're on the right side of that and you can continue to get the full advantages that God has intended for you. But I want to talk about it from this standpoint. Uh, I think a lot of us in the body of Christ have a wrong idea uh, concerning uh, what true prosperity is from God's perspective and, and, and his will concerning prosperity for his people. And, 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 and I think we, we also have some... Uh, some expectations that are erroneous. They're not really founded on what God is saying in the book. And so uh, let me continue to read this and then I'll, I'll, I'll make another couple of comments here. Uh, so he talks about uh, returning to God that your sins may be erased, blotted out, wiped clean. That times of refreshing, times of refreshing, of recovering from the effects of the heat and reviving with fresh air may come from the presence of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I mean, that's exciting to me that, re that times of refreshing come from the result of God's presence. Amen. Hallelujah. And he's present within each and every one of us. Everywhere we are, everywhere we, we go, he's there with us. Amen. He's there before we get there, but yet he's in us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we can tap into to his presence uh, for, the, for, the, for that refreshing anytime we need to. We can be revived. Amen. We don't have to continue suffering, being worn out and, and drained and exhausted and growing weary and tired of well doing and being beaten down by the circumstances of life. No, we have within us the very presence of God from which we can be revived and refreshed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all, y'all all right tonight. Amen. All right. So so let me uh, let me let me get on here with verse 18. It says, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, verse, verse 20. And he, and, and okay, so it talks about, let me finish up with verse, verse uh, 19 and go back to verse 20. All right, so it talks about that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send to you the Christ, the Messiah, who before was designated and appointed for you, even Jesus, whom heaven must receive and retain. So heaven has received Jesus Christ, amen? He, 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 he ascended on high, right? And so heaven received him, but heaven must also retain him, right? That means he cannot come back until some certain things happen and occur, right? So, so now, now, now we know that he's soon to come. We know we're in the last days. Even when he first ascended, the body of Christ at that time began to speak of that day as the last days. 
And that's been uh, uh, 2,000 plus years ago. So certainly we are in the last days in our day, amen? And, and, and more, more probably we're in the last hours of the last days. So we, we, so we, can, we, can, we can rest assured that the, that, the, that the coming of Jesus is sooner than it ever has been. Amen? And, and that time period is getting shorter and shorter with each passing day, right? And yet there are some things that God desires to accomplish and bring to fruition in the earth for us before heaven can release Jesus to return. So with that, with that being so, with his time to come fastly approaching, and yet there are things that God desires to see fulfilled in our lives, then there is a whole lot of good stuff that has to yet happen in a short period of time before Jesus can come back. And we're at that time, we're at that point, we're at that little wrinkle, that sliver uh, in time where we should be expecting to see and behold the fulfillment of things God has spoken from prophets of old. We need to be in expectance of having these things come to pass in our lives today. Are yeah. right, y'all follow what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, so let, let, let me finish that. So he says, uh, he says, whom heaven must receive and retain until the time, listen, for the complete restoration of all that God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets for ages past from the most ancient time in the memory of man. So, so, so everything we have recorded here in this Bible, right? Th 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 this was divinely inspired, right? By the Holy Spirit. It came straight, now, now understand, be, be, before it was written, it was spoken by God, yeah, right. by the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. Okay, well, he spoke it to someone in the earth who in turn spoke it themselves. Amen. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So every record we ha everything we have on record in terms of the will of God and the desires and plans of purposes of God, uh, concerning his people, things that are going to happen in the earth, he spoke it, and then in turn, a prophet in the earth spoke the same thing. Amen. And so he's saying here that, that before Jesus can return, there must be the complete restoration of everything God originally intended, everything he spoke by the prophets from man's most ancient memory. Each and every one of those things must be fulfilled in the earth. And everything, now listen, 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 listen. Everything he began to speak by the prophets uh, was for the purposes of, of his original intent being recreated for the good and benefit of mankind. That's really a, a, a good working definition for restoration, to recreate God's original intent for the family of man, Right? So all the promises of God that we see, those are the things that are originally intended by God for the entire family of man that because of Adam's sin and the curse that, released, that was released and the effect it had on the earth, the original intent and, de and desires of God got, got perverted and distorted and conditions and circumstances in the earth became something other than what he intended. But the, but the fact that they became distorted and perverted did not change what he originally intended. So his original intent is still his intent for us even in this hour. And so all that he has spoken by the mouth of prophets from man's most ancient memory, even to Jesus' return, must come to pass in the earth. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So he says... Heaven must retain Jesus until the complete restoration of all things, right? Now, I, I share it with us uh, by the Spirit of God that, that, that God is taking us into a greater measure and a greater dimension of his glory. Glory meaning the manifestation of his goodness. Are you following what I'm saying? So the complete restoration of all things and moving into a greater measure and dimension of the glory of God, uh, we're talking about some, the goodness of God manifesting in our lives in areas in which we've not seen it and on levels beyond what we have seen. Are y'all following what I'm saying? All right, now, now, now. 
when you talk about the complete restoration of all things, we're also talking about the unveiling or the unfolding of God's original plans and purposes. Before they can be fulfilled, they must be revealed. Right? So we're in a place of great hope and expectancy to have more of the heart of God and the plans of God revealed to us than what we have known before. We're, we're in a place where we can have a greater understanding. We can have his heart and desires revealed in greater depth, right? So, so we're in that place where his word and his heart is being unfolded. Revelations, re revelation, revelation, revelation that the body has either lost or let slip into the recesses of our mind. And as a result of letting them slip, they're no longer in the forefront of our thinking. No, they no longer have the weight and the effect or the, uh, the impact on our thinking and our belief system. Right? And so, so God is restoring revelation back to the body of Christ. Right? And, and, and in this day and this hour, for us, uh, I know by the Spirit of God, in, in, in the restoration of all things and the unfolding of revelations that have been lost or, or, or laid to the side that we've, that we've gone without because of religion and false doctrine and all kinds of stuff, in the restoration of all things and the unfolding of revelation, he is going to be emphasizing uh, the revelation of his will for us to be rich, to prosper, to have abundance. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So, 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 so let me just say it. Let me just say it. If in case you didn't know, in case you didn't know, you need to sell it in your heart. God, God's will for you is to be rich. God wants you rich. Amen. Are you understand what I'm saying? Amen. Now, now, now I got news for you. God has already made you rich. In terms of God's perspective, when we talk about God's perspective, and, and God's definition of rich, you are already rich. Just as you're already born again and in right standing with God, you're already rich. Same way you're born again in right standing with God, you're already healed. Right? You're already rich. You're just as rich as you're ever going to be. Because being rich ain't got nothing to do with how much you have in your possession. Being rich is about who you are. It's not about what you have. And so you got to understand, you really have, we really have to make that differentiation. See, the rich young ruler messed up on that. See, see, the Lord was trying, the Lord was actually calling him, I believe, into uh, that apostolic ministry that the other disciples entered into, right? It, it, he he would have been the perfect replacement for Judas. And so, I mean, think about it. What he said to him was, was not any different than what he said to the other disciples, right? Now, that rich young ruler, he was rich. He was young, right? I mean, think, have you ever thought about if he's young, how did he get so rich? I mean, think about it. And now, now he, he talked about how he kept the, 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 the law, the commandments from his youth. So certainly that had something to do with it. Hey, Amen. That had a lot to do with it. But I, I just wonder, could it have been that he, he was rich because of an inheritance? You understand what I'm saying? My, 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 okay, but my, my, my point is, my point is, when, when he was inquiring about eternal life, and he wasn't asking about going to heaven, because Jesus' response to him was about the commandments, and it ain't about us keeping a... Nothing, not, nothing about our works is what's going to get us to heaven. Amen. We're going to heaven, that's a lot, but it ain't got nothing to do about, with our works. Right? Amen. Now, 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 he, he, he began to say, he said, all of these have I kept. Jesus said, well, one thing you lack. Well, that's, that's twofold. I think one in one aspect, the one thing he lacked, there was a commandment that he did lack, and that was to have no other God before God. Amen. And he had allowed his riches and possessions to take God's place, and, and he had tied his hope to his possessions. Because when Jesus told him to sell, to, to, to sell it and then give the proceeds to the poor, he went away sad at the thought of not having so, so, so if we believe that we're, if we, if we believe we're rich based on what we have, anytime God speaks to us about giving and we believe our riches are based on what we have and, and now, now understand if, if we've allowed what we have to replace who gave it to us, we're not going to be willing to part with what we have. 
But if you understand that you're rich on the basis of who you are and whose you are, regardless of what you have or don't have, you can be more free and willing in your giving because what you give away doesn't change who you are. Are y'all following what I'm saying? All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Believe it or not, I ain't planning to get into any of that that, that far. I want to tell you the definition of rich. To have a full supply, an abundant supply. To, uh, to, to whatever your expenses, whatever your costs, whatever your demands, to be rich is to have a full supply, an abundant supply to cover every expense and cost, to meet every demand, right? The, the, the means to abound to every good work God has called you to. A full supply, right? Now, we are rich because of who we are. Now, how much we actually have in possession is going to be determined by the level of my maturity and our understanding uh, and, 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 and our stewardship. See, you're rich because of who you are. Just born, being born again you know, you, you, be, you, you are born into uh, a wealthy family. Amen. You become an heir of God, a joint heir along with Jesus Christ. So as a joint heir along with Jesus, Jesus himself said, everything the Father has is mine. If you're a joint heir, everything the Father has is yours. So what's going to determine how much is, is actually in your hand is going to boil down to, to, our, to, to our level of maturity as well as our stewardship. Are y'all understand what I'm saying? All right. So, 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 huh. go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter, everybody good? Amen. Hallelujah. So, so, <clears throat> we're going to look at, look at something here. Uh, You there? All right, so look at verse, look at verse, uh, I want to read verse 4 and 5. Now, this is Paul speaking. He says, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Say man's wisdom. Man's wisdom. Right? So if we're talking about man's wisdom, the thing that's tied to man's wisdom is man's ability, man's power. Right? So, so he says, he says, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? So that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see that? Now, here's a statement for you. The power we live by is tied to the wisdom we live by. Or you can say it this way, the power that actually keeps and sustains us in life is tied to the wisdom we apply in life. Now, now Paul is making a, a distinction between the wisdom of man and all the power and ability tied to man's wisdom and the power of God. God's power is actually tied to God's wisdom. And so he's saying that our faith should not trust in the wisdom and power of man, but our faith should actually be in the wisdom and the power of God. Right? So, so, so you, 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 have two different, uh, you, you, you have two different systems here, if you will. We, we have the wisdom of man, the answers and solutions that man presents as a way of salvation or as a way of overcoming and prevailing against the evil that's in this world. You have man's ideology, man's reasoning and wisdom and systems that he has presented as a way of navigating life, of doing life, right? Are you understand what I'm saying? OK, so that is a system. But then you have God's system or God's ways of doing so. The, way, the ways God has prescribed for his people to go about life. So you have two different systems and, and these two systems operate uh, from two sources of wisdom. So if you're talking about man's wisdom and man's system, you're talking about a wisdom that 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 came 
from a fallen man in his attempt to get back to a place that he once was, even though in his, in his carnal mind he don't know that. But when you're talking about God's wisdom, you're talking about the revealed truth from God's heart to you that, that allows you to, to live and enjoy the, the, the quality of life that he originally intended for you from the jump before Adam messed it up through sin. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So we're talking about two different systems here that function by two different uh, levels or types of wisdom. And so, so if we want to see the restoration of all things, the recreation of what God originally intended, if we, if we, if, if we want what God intended for us, then, then we have to recognize it's not coming by any system that man came up with. It's coming by his system, his wisdom, and it's, it's a, and which allows us to be sustained and kept by his power, which in comparison to that of man is super in his essence, right? So we're, we're talking about walking in the supernatural power of God in our everyday lives and affairs. We're talking about receiving supernatural help in our everyday affairs in our daily walk with God. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Okay, so now, 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 we're talking about, now I'm telling you these are two different systems, right? All right, so let's, let's take a look at it real quick. Go to, go to Psalm, go to Psalms uh, 73. Ah, shoot. Bro, can you get my phone for me, please? I got, I want to, I want to show you, uh, oh, you got your key. Appreciate it. I meant to bring my phone out here because I wanted to look at it in a, in a, in a different translation. But I'm going to read it to you. Uh, so let's, let's just look at Psalm 73 from the King James, right? Because, see, we're going to contrast God, uh, man's wisdom and the ability, man's wisdom and the power and ability that, 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 that is a product of that wisdom or that system. And, and, and we're going to contrast that to God's wisdom and the power and ability that is a result of his system. We're going to contrast the two and see the difference in, in the quality of life we're able to enjoy, thank you, sir, from, from, from those systems. Y'all with me? All right, so, so let's, let's go to the King James first. Psalm 73, and I'm going to, re I'm going to read right much here, but, but li just listen by the Spirit of God. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, and, there is strength in, and their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people returneth hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? In other words, they begin to question God. Behold, these are the ungodly who prospereth in the world. They increase in riches. All right? So, so, so the world's uh, system, man's wisdom, uh, is capable of of producing uh, a level or a measure of what the world calls good and a lot of what we might call good, right? But, but, because, because, but, but because of the wisdom that it's based on is faulty and flawed, it's insufficient to sustain it against the evils of this world. Are y'all following what I'm saying? All right, all right, so, 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 so then let's, let's, let's keep reading a little bit. All right, so uh, verse 12, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosperous in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. So he's, he's thinking, man, I, I, I didn't try to live a good life for nothing, right? And the enemy will mess with you like that, right? 
You, you trying to do right and, and follow God and tithe and stand and live holy and you see people that look like they could care less about God or goodness or what and they look like they're doing all right. All right, but let's, let's keep watching. Let's, let's keep reading. He says, uh, Verily I've cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. So in other words, when he got with God, he began to get some understanding. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou, thou castest them down with destruction. How, how are they brought unto desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O oh Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Now, let me read, let me read that from the, from, the, from the Passion Translation. It says this, No one can deny it. God is really good to Israel and to all those with pure hearts. But I nearly missed seeing it for myself. Here's my story. I narrowly missed losing it all. I was stumbling over what I saw the wicked doing. For when I saw the boasters with such wealth and prosperity, I became jealous over their smug security, indulging in whatever they wanted, going where they wanted, doing what they wanted, with no care in the world, no pain, no problems, they seemed to have it made. They lived as though life would never end. They didn't even try to hide their pride and opulence. Cruelty and violence are parts of their lifestyle. Pampered and pompous, vice oozes from their souls. They overflow with vanity. They're such snobs looking down their noses. They even scoff at God. They are nothing but bullies threatening God's people. They are loud mouths with no fear of God pretending to know it all. Windbags full of hot air impressing only themselves. Yet the people keep coming back to listen to more of their nonsense. They tell their cohorts, God will never know. See, he has no clue of, what's, of what we're doing. These are the wicked ones I'm talking about. They never have to lift a finger, living a life of ease while their riches multiply. Have I been foolish to play by the rules and keep my life pure? Here I am suffering under your discipline day after day. I feel like I'm being punished all day long. If I had given in to my pain and spoken of what I was really feeling, it would have sounded like unfaithfulness to the next generation. When I tried to understand it all, I just couldn't. It was too puzzling, too much of a riddle to me. But then one day I was brought into the sanctuaries of God and in the sight of glory, my distorted perspective vanished. See, when you bring stuff to the light of God's word, you get a right perspective. Then I understood that, that the destiny of the wicked was near. They're the ones who are on the slippery path and God will suddenly let them slide off into destruction to be consumed with terrors forever. It will be an instant end to all their life of ease, a blink of the eye, and they're swept away by sudden calamity. They are nothing more than momentary monarchs, soon to disappear like a dream when one awakens. When the rooster crows, Lord God, you will despise their life of fantasies. Wow. So, so the wisdom of the world and the ability and power thereof seems to produce a certain type of prosperity. But if you examine it closely, there's no genuine substance, it's just a shadow. Because when they deal with adversity and evil, their system, their wisdom does not produce a power sufficient to defend them and protect them from the evil of this world. So ultimately, they are, they are playing right into Satan's hands, sowing unto the flesh and reaping uh, corruption. And, and it's, it's going to hit, it's going to hit hard, it's going to hit fast. And, and they won't even know what hit them. Are right, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, that's the wisdom of this world. And so Paul is trying to get us to, di di to, di differ to, di to differentiate from the world's wisdom and its ability to keep us and true wisdom from God and his supernatural power to keep us, right? All right, so now let's, now, now let's go to Psalm 20. Let's, let's look at this thing in, in Psalm 20. And, and uh, I'm going to read it first from the King James. 
And I want to look at that from the, from the Passion Translation. Psalm 20. All right. It says, the Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. Now, this, this particular passage, uh, if you listen and prayerfully meditate on it, you'll see that the things that is being asked of God to do for us is actually reflects um, God's plan for the restoration of all things. See, everything, everything you have a true, genuine, godly desire for, the only way you can truly desire it is that it is available to you. It's what God intended for you. And, and the fact that you desire it is a cry from your spirit uh, realizing that it's missing and it should be. And so if you got a, a, a now I'm not talking about a lust or a craving, but I'm talking about a genuine, genuine godly desire. That, that's, your, that's your spirit crying out to daddy in acknowledgement that it's missing and it ought to be here. And you cannot have a genuine godly desire for something God has if God don't have it. Because it ain't nothing for your spirit to cry out for. Are right, you understand what I'm saying? All right, so, so, so Psalm 20, I think, captures the heart of God in terms of his intent for what he, what he originally wanted us to enjoy. Victory, success, prosperity. So verse 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The, saint, the name of the God of Jacob defend thee. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. Now see, if you know how to get God to hear you when you're facing trouble, you'll always overcome trouble. See, he says, the Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt, thy burnt sacrifice. Selah. Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear, he will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. The saving strength of his right hand. All right? That, that represents authority, power, dominion. All, Jesus is at the right hand. We are seated in Jesus at the right hand. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? All right, so, so with, your saving, uh, with the saving strength of his right hand. Look at verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Now, to trust in chariots and to trust in horses, that's a type of the world system. They're placing their trust in systems, uh, uh, in methodology uh, of warfare uh, that's born out of man's wisdom, right? But, but, but he's making a contrast. He says, yes, yeah, some people do that. He says, but as for us, we're going to remember, we're going to remain mindful and, and trusting in the name of the Lord our God. He says, and they are brought down and fallen. Why? From putting their trust in the wrong place. But we are risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. Let the king hear us when we, cry, when we call. Verse 7 says, some trust, in, some trust in and boast of chariots and some of horses, but we will trust in and boast of the name of the Lord our God. So that's the distinction. That's a type and shadow. Just saying what Paul is talking about. Don't place your trust and confidence in the wisdom of men because if you try to live by man's wisdom, it limits you to man's power and ability. But rather put your trust and confidence in the wisdom of God, which affords you his supernatural power and ability. Are uh, you understand what I'm saying? One, one is limited and, it, and it's, sooner or later you're going to face a measure and a level of evil that your ability can't sustain you. And if that's all you got, that's as far as you go. But if your trust is in God's wisdom and his revealed truth, then you have access to, 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 to his super, the very power he used to resurrect Jesus from the dead is available to you to the degree that you live and apply his wisdom. To the degree that you do things his way. So if I'm doing things his way, I need to expect the supernatural power and help he promised. I need to intentionally do things his way in order to have the supernatural power and ability he promised. Are uh, you understand what I'm saying? Now, now let me read that just for a minute from, from, the, from, the, from the passage translation. It says, in your day of danger, may Yahweh answer and deliver you. And the reason I'm, I'm doing it, because when I was in, uh, 
in, in, in prayer with the Lord Thursday morning, he directed me to Psalm 20. And I read it, and then he told me to read it in the, in the, in the, in the Passion Translation. And I read it, and, 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 and then I said, okay, Lord, what, what is the main thing you want me to take away from this? And this is what he said. Expect the supernatural. Expect the supernatural. See, see and, and, I'll, and I'll come back to that. All right, so in your day of danger, may Yahweh answer and deliver you. May the name of the God of Jacob set you safely on high. May supernatural help be sent from his sanctuary. May he support you from Zion's fortress. Glory to God. May he remember every gift you have given him and celebrate your sacrifice of love you have shown him. Now, now see, that's what happened to Cornelius. He prayed and offered alms unto God. And the Bible says that his giving came up as a memorial before God, causing him to divinely intervene in the earth on Cornelius' family, having Peter go from one place to another so he could have household salvation. Never underestimate the power of your seed. Never, never underestimate the power and the benefit of giving. Glory to God. All right, so, so, so he says, may he remember every gift you've given him and celebrate every sacrifice of love you've shown him. Pause in his presence, Selah. May Yahweh give you every desire of your heart and carry out your every plan as you go to battle. When you succeed, we will celebrate and shout for joy. Flags will fly when victory is yours. Yes, God will answer your prayers and we will praise him. I know Yahweh gives me all that I ask for and brings victory to his anointed king. My deliverance cry will be heard in his holy heaven. By his mighty hand, miracles will manifest through his saving strength. Some find their strength in their weapons and wisdom, but my miracle deliverance can never be won by men. Now let me stop right there. <clears throat> well, let me keep going. Our boast is in Yahweh, our God, who makes us strong and gives us victory. Our enemies will not prevail. They will only collapse and perish in defeat while we rise up full of courage. Give victory to our king, O Yahweh. The day we call on you, give us your answer. Now let's come back to verse 7. Some find their strength in their weapons and their wisdom, but my miracle deliverance can never be won by men. Right? So now that same verse in the King James, right? said somebody some put their trust in chariots and horses right so notice notice now notice what he says in the, in the passage he says some find their strength in their weapons and their wisdom but my miracle deliverance can never be won by men so in other words in other words <clears throat> trusting in man's wisdom limits you to man's ability but he's talking about miracle defense. So when you trust in God's wisdom, it avails to you the miraculous power of God. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, now, here's what the Lord said to me while, while I was, you know, in, in preparation for this. He said, get ready for the miraculous to become commonplace in your life and ministry. Get ready for the miraculous to become commonplace in your life and your ministry. Now that, 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 that means get ready, you congregation, for the miraculous to become commonplace in your everyday lives, in your walk with God, in the service you render to God. Get ready for the miraculous power of God to defend you, to become commonplace. Expect the supernatural. See, we, we, we tend to think of miracles after we have exhausted everything we can do in the natural and then it don't work. We're like, oh, Lord, we need a miracle. No, miracles are, should be commonplace. Now, now, let me understand. We, 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 we shouldn't always be in a place where we got to have God to come through. But our everyday walk with God should reflect his miraculous power daily. You see the difference? Uh -huh. Hallelujah. And we talked about what is the miraculous? The miraculous, Jesus says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, the rule of God, the authority of God, the dominion of God, the government of God. So the kingdom of God 
differentiates from the kingdom of heaven. When you look at the original language, the kingdom of heaven is translated the kingdom, the kingdoms, the kingdom from the heavens, plural. So the kingdom of God is when a portion of the rule of God descends, comes down, descends from the heavens, and is manifest on earth, exerting itself over present evil conditions, setting things right, making them what they ought to be, and that should be a part of our daily life. Get ready for the miraculous to become commonplace in your life. Prepare for it. Expect it. Are you understand what I'm saying? All right. So, so now, now let's let's back up. Now, now let's let's back our way back up to verse two. And 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 I just want to I just want to reiterate this one. Verse two. He says, uh, "May supernatural help be sent from His sanctuary. May supernatural help be sent from His sanctuary." Glory to God. So we are to expect the supernatural power of God to be manifested in our everyday lives. We ought to expect that, right? Now, expect the supernatural. Now, now I just, I'm going to share a little bit of the conversation, a little question and answer I had with God about, okay, what, how, what, 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 what am I, how do I go about expecting the supernatural? I, I mean, think about it. How do you expect it? How, because obviously, I'm talking to, I said, okay, Lord, you're telling me to expect it, and I thought I was, but you're telling me to do it, so obviously I wasn't. So what do I do differently to actually be expecting the supernatural? And you understand what I'm saying? If God is telling you to do something, and you think you're doing it, well, you, obviously you ain't doing it right, or else he wouldn't tell you. So I was like, okay, Lord, what, what, how do I expect the super, so, so, I ain't going to take you through all of it, but then it hit me. I just saw it. I said, oh, and I said it like this, and I wrote it down. I said, okay, so, Lord, to, to expect the supernatural is to expect to hear you. Now, think about that for a minute. How much of what you do in daily affairs do you do expecting to hear God talk to you about it? So to expect the supernatural is to expect to hear God. Well, if, if I'm going to expect to hear him, I got to be listening. Amen. I got to be deliberate and intentional in listening. So, so we're talking about communion. We're talking about fellowship. We're talking about maintaining an open, uh, uh, open conversation, if you will, ongoing fellowship with the Lord, right? So, so it hit me. I said, okay, Lord. So, so you're saying to expect the supernatural is to expect to hear your voice. And it's like he came back like, yes, son. And I, and, and I put it in explanation for it. He said, expect to hear me. Listen inwardly for me to speak. Commune with me, inquire of me, expecting to hear, and you will. Because see, everything we do with God, everything we receive from God, we do it by faith. We receive it by faith. You hear God by faith. Now, I'm not saying that everything you hear is going to be God. But I'm saying that, that, that everything you hear by the inward witness of the Holy Spirit, you can discern what is God and what's not. But you do need to go, you need to approach him with the expectation of him talking and answering and you hearing. Amen. Commune with him, inquire of him. Expecting to hear him and you will. And then when you hear, obey. Obey him. Obey him. It might not seem logical. It, more than likely it won't. It, it won't seem reasonable. It might seem a little skeptical. It might invoke a little anxiety initially. Uh, but if, you, if, you, if, if it's consistent with the word and you have that inward witness from the Holy Spirit, then, then, then that's God. And so, see, see, what's going to make it easier to do this is, is settling in your heart uh, whose you are. 
whom you belong. Who is your source? What, what is the driving motive for you getting up and, and, and doing what you do? Is it to serve self or God? Is it to be gratified? Is it to get the accolades of men? Is it to get all you can get your hand on? Or is it to actually honor God in your decisions and your choices? Is it actually to glorify him in how you live and, and, and what you say and what you do? See, a lot of times what you hear is going to be based on the motive in which you're, try, in, in which you're going about something. Amen. And if you, got, if you got your motive right, it's a whole lot easier to hear right or to know what you're hearing is right. So a lot of times we, we approach God asking God about something and we already got our mind made up what we want him to say. And so a lot of times if we hear what we want to hear, you really don't know if you're hearing what God said or you're hearing what that idol in your heart said because that's what you wanted to hear. And if the motive didn't have nothing to do with God, was just about gratifying self, nine out of ten times, it won't go. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight means to be yielded, surrendered, right? It means to become pliable and soft, right? So if I'm going to delight myself in the Lord, I'm going to take joy and delight in the Lord and his will for me. I'm going to become pliable and soft and tender and yielded to his will for me. And in doing so, he will give me the desires of my heart. That's twofold. Yeah, he'll give you things you desire. But, but more importantly, by being yielded and surrendered to him and his will for you, he's going to give you, he's going to birth within you a desire for what he wills for you. He's going to give you what he wants for you, and you're going to perceive it as a desire. And when you perceive that desire, if you can honestly say and you have judged your motive and your intent is pure and to serve God, then you, you, can, you can put some trust and confidence in that desire. Trusting God's going, 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 that he's going to, he's, he's got you. If, if, listen, if you missed up, the Bible says, I hear a voice behind me saying, this is the way, turn ye therein and walk therein. He'll correct you. Are y'all you, following what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Okay, so, so, Job, Job 36 and 11 talks about obedience, right? It says, they that obey shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. They that make God their source and trust his system. Those who, who, who trust in what he's saying, what he's revealing, his wisdom, right? Will receive supernatural power to cause their days to be days of prosperity and their years of pleasure. Oh, wait a minute, y'all. Okay, you, you follow what I'm saying? Okay, now I shared this statement <clears throat> Sunday, and, 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 and I am, uh, I'm, 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 I, it, it wasn't just for, for, for that congregation. It's not just for this congregation, right? But it's for any congregation or persons that, hmm, uh, Let me just pause right there. I'll come back to that. I don't want to get into that just yet. Just let me come back. But let's rest assured I'm about to share with you is for us tonight. Okay? All right. So this, this, is, this is like, a, a, and, and I want to share with you a testimony. This is, this is what the Lord had told me uh, to, to get into or to share uh, with uh, the congregation uh, there, there at Living Faith with Chaplain Downey. And I did that. And uh, I have a testimony from, from, I got a testimony from them the next day about it. So here's the statement. This is what the Lord impressed upon me and ministered to me. He said, God is moving, th this is the statement, God is moving in our lives and he's moving on our behalf in order to restore us. You get that? God is moving in our lives and on our behalf in order to restore us. To restore us to the place we should be and would be if we had not missed him to begin with and gone astray. 
Are you seeing that? You better catch that. He's bringing about change, change in position, change in status. You're going from the bottom to the top. You're going from the back to the front, for you are the head and not the tail. Now, this is what he said. He said, this change is not by natural means over the natural course of time, but by supernatural means in which time is being condensed and things are happening at an accelerated rate. Now, now go to John chapter 2, and I want to read you the testimony of that before, um, before well, actually, I, I will read John chapter 2. And then, and then I'll get into the testimony. So remind me to share the testimony, which. All right, so John 2, are you there? All right, I, I think John 2 captures uh, what, I, what I just shared, right? And, um, and, and this is a statement you can write down, it, it, and it'll, it'll help you. It, it, understand, if it matters to you, it matters to God. Sometimes things can seem mundane and trivial and uh, like, like in the enemy will make you think, um, well, that ain't, that ain't no big deal. No, 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 if it matters to you, it matters to God, which means he has something to say to you about it. He's willing to help you with it. He, he wants the best for you concerning it, regardless of how big or small it seems to, 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 to us, right? So, so now, now we're talking about things not happening by natural means over the natural course of time, but supernatural means where time is being condensed and things happening at an accelerated rate. All right. So in John 2, we see that Jesus and, and, and the disciples were invited uh, to, the, to this wedding, uh, this marriage in Cana, right? And, mother, and Jesus's mother was there. She, she might have been the coordinator of the thing. I don't know. But she took a personal interest in this. And so... Um, it says Jesus and the disciples were called, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. Okay, so they have no wine. So they came to a point in the wedding, in this ceremony, in which they ran out of wine. Now, that's not a life-threatening situation. No big deal. However, now notice, Mary could have, Mary, Mary, I, I mean, I, we don't know the particulars. But, I mean, she, she, she could have sent somebody, you know, th th to food line or, or somewhere. to get, But she went to Jesus to deal with the shortage of wine. Uh -huh. And so Jesus is saying, okay, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour was not yet come. His mother didn't pay any mind to it. She simply turned to the servants. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now that's a key right there. If you want to receive supernatural help, if you want God's best in your life, that's it right there. Whatever he say, do it. When you inquire of him, expecting to hear him answer you, you do so with, with the intent to obey what, what he tells you. Whatever he says, you do it, then you, you, hey, it's a wrap. It's a wrap, right? All right, so, now, so, so, <laughs> ah. verse 6. And there was set there six water pots. Okay, I will. So, so you got, whatever he says to you, do it. But you got to understand, God is going to talk to us on the level of our understanding in terms of instructions. He, he's going to instruct us according to our capacity to believe and obey. Because he would really do us a disservice to instruct us beyond that. Therefore, if he's instructing you in something, you best believe he's checked us out and he's decided we're in a place where we can obey. We can do it if we'll trust him. That, but that, see, there's, there's some things that we're not even open to hear from God because of, of, of immaturity on our part. Are right, y'all following what I'm saying? All right, all right. So, so let's go. Mother said, whatever he says, do it. Okay. There, was, there were there set there six water pots of stone and after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two to three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto his servants, fill the water pots with water. They filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear. In other words, they fill the water up. He says, All right, dip your cup in there. Take that cup that you just put. Take that cup of water you just put in that pot and take it to the governor who's wanting wine. Now, the governor, he's, he's a leading city official. He got a little juice. He got a little weight. 
So, so I, I mentioned that to, to because, I mean, I mean, I just imagine what this servant was thinking. Now, he know good well that's water. And he's being asked to take it to the governor who won't wine. That could be a little tricky. And it can be a little tricky for us sometimes when we are so aware of our, of our circumstances and our conditions, yet we're being instructed by God to take action as though our circumstances and conditions were different. See, we got to understand whatever God is saying to us, he's speaking from a perspective and we're, and we're hearing it from a perspective or we're looking, we're looking at the situation from a, a perspective and he's speaking to us from a perspective. That's why it's important that we get on board with his perspective. Are y'all following what I'm saying? <clears throat> so, 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 so he did it. And the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine. Okay, so the water was made wine from some point of filling it up and taking it to, to his lips. It was made wine. Okay, so first of all, is that natural means or supernatural means? That's supernatural means all day. Water don't become wine. No kind of way science can't do it. It doesn't happen. It's supernatural. It's, it's, that's the miracle working power of God. That's supernatural, right? Right? But remember, time is condensed. Things happen at an accelerated rate. So he talks about how most folk put the good wine out first, let people get drunk. Then after they drunk, they put the cheap stuff out to save the good wine. But he said you did the opposite. You put the best wine out first. I mean, you, you saved the best wine for last, right? So, so not only did God supernaturally turn the water to wine, but he made it the best wine, right? Now, as I, I shared with him Sunday, I think I've shared it here before too. Several years ago, we were invited to a, a, a reward, awards dinner for our daughter. We were sitting at the table with some people, and one of the ladies at the table owned vineyards, and she had a winery. It, they, 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 that was a business. And so I remember I asked her about what, about how much time does it take to create a fine wine? And she said, well, it, there's some different factors. First of all, you got to get, you got to get your grapes. You know, you got to have your vines. You got to plant them, right? And in a lot of cases, different things determine, then the vines begin to grow, but they don't produce grapes right away. That could be a number of years before they produce grapes, and then it then and then it comes to harvesting the grapes and then you you go you in, you begin the process of, of of it fermenting and becoming wine. And if it's going to be a fine wine, then it's got to be aged and put up. Right. And she said, so a conservative number of years to for for from start to finish for a fine wine would be 20 plus years. But Jesus did it in minutes. Time is being condensed. Things are happening at an accelerated rate. Financial advisors may tell you you can be out of debt in three, in three years, depending on your debt ratio. But God can get us out of debt in minutes. Amen. Amen. See, see, whatever needs to happen to move you from the back to the front, from the bottom to the top, whatever needs to happen to take you into a greater measure and demonstration of his glory, his manifest goodness, is happening at, at an accelerated rate. There are changes in position and status that is happening for us even as we gather here in the name of the Father, Son, Jesus Christ, responding in faith to what we're hearing by his spirit. His supernatural power is at work to affect change. So the whole point is we've got to make God our source. One other place. You write there in John 2. Go to John 3. In order for heaven to be your supply line, God has got to be your source. In order to receive supernatural help from heaven, heaven supply, you got to make God. His word, what he's revealing to you and instructing you to do, that's got to be your source in order to have his power. Right? 
Say, I want heaven to be my supply line. Go, you in John 3? Let me read verse 27 to you from the King James. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. We read verse 27 from the Amplified Classic. John answered, a man can receive nothing. He can claim nothing. He can take nothing unto himself. Not, he, can, he, he, he can claim nothing. He can take nothing unto himself, nothing, except it has been granted to him from heaven. A man must be content to receive the gift which is given him from heaven. There is no other source. There's no other source. Not for us. If, if you try to make the wisdom of man your source, you're going to be limited to the, to the power and ability of man. And evil will prevail. But if you make God your source, then heaven becomes your supply. And you can receive supernatural help for the restoration of all things. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Well, let's, let's, let's just uh, worship the Lord now in our giving. Praise God. And I want to pray uh, for, for if there are those. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you, brother. I want to get a testimony. Hallelujah. You got to get a testimony. So that's what I preach uh, Sunday. Things being condensed. Time, uh, things happening at an accelerated rate. So uh, Chaplain Down and his wife, First Lady Enza sent this. She said, from one of our members wanted to share with you. This is what they sent her. Mother, I can't even type this text fast enough. The word Dr. Foster put out yesterday has already manifested. Just found out from my contract deputy that our team is being put in for a spot award due to the level and extent we're producing products for our government clients. Don't know, um, don't know amount, but I'm expecting great things. Just like the man of God said, supernatural, unexpected, and out of nowhere can our God pour out the blessing we won't have room enough to receive. Expect the supernatural. So, let, 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 let's, let's worship in our giving. And then I want to I want to pray, uh, particularly, uh, you know, for us and those that may be uh, joining us virtually. So uh, you all don't have this, do you? I think this is listed. There's a stack of them outside, but I'm just going to read it to you today. But make sure you get one before you leave. Take it home. Bring it back Sunday. And we're going to do a corporate confession of this. Right. And, and so this is this is. This is meant to be done as a confession concerning our tithes and offerings. But I'm just going to read it to you today. And, uh, and the reason, and, and see, Chaplain Downey, uh, their congregation did this Sunday. And I, I could really feel the power in it as they were confessing it. And I mentioned it to him, and, and he talked about some of the things that they experienced as a result of this confession. And then it slacked up. And when they looked, they realized everybody that received the offering wasn't doing the confession. And so they got back on the confession, right? Because see, see your, 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 your words have power. And if you ain't saying nothing, you ain't releasing nothing. You ain't changing nothing, all right? So, so this is, this is the, the, um, the confession. Lord, your word says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. Improve me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Father, we praise and thank you that heaven's windows are open to us and you're pouring out a blessing. You're pouring out upon us your blessing until we don't have room enough to receive it. Your word also says that you love a cheerful giver. Therefore, Lord, we willingly, faithfully and cheerfully worship you with all our giving through tithes and offerings. We release our faith and finances so that all our ministry facilities that they have in here will be built because they're believing God and building a new facility. So they say all our ministry facilities will be built. I change it to all our ministry facilities are sustained. And your vision for us in this ministry will be established on earth. We believe that as we sow seed to establish the vision of your house, you, you will also establish ours. Therefore, as a result of our obedience and love and giving, we thank you for raises, increases, and promotions. 
borrowed money to be returned to us, rebates, dividends, gifts and inheritance, canceled debt and surprise checks in the mail, a sevenfold return on all the enemy has stolen, a hundredfold return on all seeds sown. We bless you for blessing the health of our bodies, the sanctity of our minds, and the quality of our relationships. We honor you for the divine favor that you bring to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So he was testifying as to they had, uh, one person had received like $20,000 debt canceled out, um, had one guy testimony who I met the guy, experienced some tough times, went a whole year, a whole year without paying his mortgage. You think they repossessed the house? No. Went a whole year without paying the mortgage. You know what they did? They refinanced it and he got it at a cheaper rate. You, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, so, <laughs> see, supernatural. We got to expect the supernatural. We need to expect to hear God, which means we need to be listening. See, it, 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 okay, all right, so you got the point. So that, that's the testimony, praise God. Um, oh, you already received it? Oh, okay. So, so, so let, me, let, let, me, uh, let me just pray. Let's, and I just want to pray. Father, Father we, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence here. We're acknowledging you, and we just worship you, and we bless you, Lord, for your word, Lord, for supernatural help in this time of need. And, Father, for, for any of us here, uh, uh, but, but particularly if there are those watching us virtually, Lord, I pray, Lord, concerning those who, who have received or been dealing with uh, symptoms cancer-like symptoms. I just got a, 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 I just, I just felt like that, that, that you, that, that, that um, you, you may have some, some symptoms that are cancer-like, but it's not, it's not cancer. It's not cancer. So Father, we just pray a comfort to those individuals right now. We command the release of your anointing and healing power to those individuals right now. We believe even as we issue the command that Jesus is performing it, and we say rise up and be healed in the name of Jesus. We come against the spirit of infirmity, whatever name it goes by, and we break its power, we break its back. We command it to cease and desist in the name of Jesus. Now Father, I pray that you would envelop every individual this applies to with your love and your presence, Lord, and a fresh and a strong way that cannot be resisted or refuted, that they would have to recognize and acknowledge your goodness, your presence, in our Father. And we just thank you for restoration for these individuals. Lord, whatever anybody else is dealing with in the area of challenges with their health, Lord, we just pray even as you sent your word, we speak that same word for the healing and the deliverance from all destruction, Father. We just bless you and praise you right now that it is well with every individual, Lord, in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we bless you and praise you for what has happened here in this house, for the unfolding of your word, for the renewing of our minds. We thank you, Lord, for it bearing fruit in our lives a hundredfold, Lord. I thank you right now that as we end this service, Lord, we continue in communion with you. We enjoy sweet communion even during the night, Lord. Minister to us by your spirit, Lord, we, that we awake tomorrow well-rested, refreshed, excited about walking with you, Lord, about walking in the supernatural. We give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Any praise report? Questions? Comments? Hallelujah. Thank God for Elder Belinda being willing, as so many of you all are, to minister. Praise God. Powerful word. <laughs>